Hi, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining today. We're just going to give everybody a few minutes to, to get online today. Welcome everyone. Happy Thursday. I bet we get eight more people signed up when we go over 400. <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to give everybody just one more minute to get logged on and then we will kick us off. So welcome everyone. Thanks for joining. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started here since we're already three minutes past. So welcome everyone to our third fireside chat. Um, we're really excited for today's conversation with Carlton Ward Jr. Um, and for those of you who have not ha met him yet, I'm happy to introduce you to Climate First, First Bank's founder, CEO and chairman, Ken LaRoe. Um, prior to starting Climate First Bank, Ken successfully founded and operated two other community banks, Florida Choice Bank and First Green Bank. Uh, first Green Bank was the nation's first bank with an environmentally stated mission, and it was the heartbreak of selling First Green Bank and the desire to leave the world a better place for his grandchildren that inspired him to start Climate First. Um, while he was reading the book Drawdown, uh, he envisioned a bank that's core mission was to reduce atmospheric CO2. When we opened Climate First Bank in June of 2021, we are the only benefit corporation bank in the state of Florida, and we've been operationally net zero since day one. Ken is a Florida State and probably more proudly a University of Florida graduate, a lifelong resident of East West Florida, and a proud husband, father, and grandfather. So thank you, Ken, for joining us today. Can you please introduce our special guest? I would be delighted. Um, I would like to introduce Carlton Ward Jr., who is an eighth generation Floridian. He is the great, great grandson of our 25th governor of the state of Florida, Doyle Carlton, who served in starting in 1928. But the most amazing thing of all is uh, Carlton is a National Geographic Explorer, the only National Geographic Explorer I've I've ever met. And so I'm, I'm completely um, blown away and enamored by that. And I was um, honored to watch Carlton's documentary, The Path of the Panther, um, with the Haddock family, and um, just completely, totally blew me away, and, and I'm delighted to have Carlton on the, our fireside chat. So, Carlton, if I could turn it over to you and let you run with it. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, everybody. Um, thanks for dialing in for this program today. Um, I'm calling in from a hotel room outside Denver because I had some travel problems on my way to a film festival in Telluride where the Path of the Panther film is being featured. But I think the internet's secure and everything's working. So I'm really excited to share this work with you. I'm going to kick it off with a trailer for our new film, Path of the Panther, that just started streaming on Disney Plus and on Hulu this month. And then I'll come back and walk you through some of my backstory and some of our primary mission of trying to save the Florida Wildlife Corridor and inspire a movement for wildlife corridors across the country. We call this area Kai Hayadle, Shimmering Waters. This is our home. Just like it's the home to the deer, the frogs and the panther. This is our home. This is the number one cause of death, right? Vehicle collision is number one. In the last two weeks, we have three. We're going to reach a threshold, or maybe we're already there for this little piece of land that's left for them. 
Florida Panthers once roamed the entire southeast, now mostly confined to just a small region along the Gulf of Mexico. These animals are like ghosts. It's so hard to show the story. And you have to show people to create that connection, that love. Damn. This morning, we're learning about a new bill that would add three major toll highways running through some of our most undeveloped areas in Florida. There's only so many pieces of unspoiled paradise left. It's been before my lifetime since the last female panther was documented north of the river. There's some nice tracks. If we can show the world who that panther is, that's going to be the spark to save this whole corridor. Now we've got a Category 5. The only population of Florida Panthers occurs right where this hurricane is going to come through. There's so much disappointment. Then there's this image of hope. If a big python gets me, will you come rescue me? I'll film it. <laughs> the animals, they don't see these imaginary lines. They're trying to get to the areas that they knew. What this group is ultimately doing is deciding the future of wild Florida. To have new generations of panthers being born here will bring this system back into balance. This is it. This is nature's last stand. Somehow it's still here, like a seed waiting to be replanted. <laughs> the panther is showing us that it's not too late. There's no limit to the balance that we can bring back across this entire continent. <laughs> So I am really excited to be able to share that story with the world, with a truly global audience. And I've been working for seven years with the film team to get this story in a package that is now distributing on Nat Geo and Disney Plus. Um, and hopefully you guys can check that out. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my quest and why I got to be spending six years of my life chasing panthers in the Everglades with camera traps. This is a picture of me in the Fakahatchee Strand down in the Everglades east of Naples, where I spent a lot of time not just photographing ghost of the camera trap, but also the ghost orchid, which I was trying to do in this shot. Um, my journey into photography started a little further from home. This is me rewind to another swampy forest in the Central African nation of Gabon, where I worked with the Smithsonian during and after graduate school. And I was a photojournalist embedded with scientists using photography to raise awareness for science and conservation issues. And it really formed my working philosophy and my niche in the world ever since. Um, it was an amazing opportunity. I spent three years um, going back on expeditions with an internationally team of scientists in places like this. They were the country of Gabon is still 80% forest covered and had a complete wildlife of forest elephants and gorillas and leopards, and an amazing place to capture the imagination of a budding photographer um, and and to kind of start to develop the skill sets to share these kind of stories of wider audiences. Here I am headless with my head in the back of a camera trap. This is a camera trap I developed in 2001 using a Nikon film camera and three flashes hidden in the trees to try to get a picture of a forest elephant walking down the beach. And this is testing another camera trap through a creek crossing in the, in the tropical rainforest of Gabon. Every once in a while, they produce some amazing results, like this leopard that I never would have seen holding a camera in my hands. This is 2001, quite a time ago, but as you'll see as we get further into the presentation, it laid the foundations for my work back here at home. Because every time I got on an airplane and left Florida for three months, I came home to a scene like this, a cattle ranch or a natural area being supplanted by new development. And even more concerningly to me, not much sense of loss associated with it. There were dozens of people who would willingly take my job to work with the Smithsonian photographing wildlife in Africa, but I didn't see enough storytelling focused on the hidden wild spaces in my home state of Florida. 
So that compelled me in about 2004 to make a full-time pivot back to Florida, looking for places where I could try to make a difference using photography. Because you might think this is another shot of Africa, but no, these are the pine forests of the Florida Panhandle and the largest contiguous longleaf pine forest left on the planet. Florida has amazing places like this, cattle ranches in the headwaters of the St. Johns River that are protecting a sixth of the state by land mass for more intensive land uses and protecting a heritage that goes back several centuries. I had a connection to these places, not just because I knew that they were ecologically valuable, but it kind of runs in my blood. I, I grew up with one foot on the coast in Florida in Clearwater, you know, a suburban kid in a highly developed suburban area, but I had one foot in the heartland because of my heritage and my ancestry. This is my, myself with my grandfather, David Ward, who was a lawyer from Tampa. And this is a picture, um, as Ken mentioned in the intro, of, of my great-grandfather, Doyle Carlton. This is a picture from the summer of 1929. He's on horseback on his family's ranch in Hardy County near Wachula where he himself was a fourth generation Floridian. The boy in the picture, eight years old, was my great uncle, Doyle Carlton Jr., who was a Florida state senator and started a pro program called Cracker Country at the state fairgrounds in Florida. I spent an eye-opening day with him in the summer of 1999. I was writing a magazine story for a class at the University of Florida. I had to do a personality profile. So I chose to spend the day with my great uncle Doyle. And we went here to the cabin at his Horse Creek Ranch. And he told me about days where they would, when he was a boy, they would drive cattle across open range, sleeping under the stars for three days and three nights at a time without ever seeing a fence. So to think about the scope of change that's happened in one man's lifetime. When he was born, there were fewer than 2 million people in the state of Florida. No, actually there were a million people in the state of Florida and now we are at 22 million today. But thankfully, his son and grandson pictured here are still full-time ranchers and cowboys in the greater Everglades and the Peace River Valley and have kept a connection to this land and kept it out of development. So I was on a mission to photograph Florida's heartland, Florida's ranches. I was also reconnecting to my own heritage through the process, um, seeing and understanding these ranches all across the state and the way they were kind of holding together our wild spaces. And that fact became really evident in 2006 when I met another ranch character, the Florida black bear. Now this is a picture of a bear living on a cattle ranch in Highlands County, Florida. It's south of Lake Placid, south of Sebring. Here I was, an eighth generation Floridian, master's degree in ecology, spent a lot of time in the Florida woods, and I didn't know we had a population of black bears living almost entirely on private lands in the northern Everglades. So this became another focus for me, related to the ranch story, but telling the story of the Florida black bear. The researchers who were studying those bears were putting GPS collars on their necks, and the bears told an amazing story. One of the bears they captured in 2009 went on a 500 mile walkabout and the GPS track traced a connected swath of land from near Sebring on the Lake Wales Ridge and Everglades headwaters all the way up the Kissimmee River Valley, across the Kissimmee Chain of Lakes, all the way up to the town of Celebration near Orlando where he spent the night for two nights and then came all the way back down to his original home range in Glades County. The reason the bear was able to walk 500 miles is because of scenes like the previous cattle ranch, this citrus grove, this pine forest. These are all working agricultural lands that hold the landscape together and provide connected, useful habitat for wildlife. The reason that bear turned around and couldn't go further north is because he bumped into this. This is the type of development pushing out of Orlando um, and a sprawling type of development that is a real threat to habitat. The bear skirted the edge of Interstate 4, presumably trying to get across to the green swamp on the other side, couldn't get there, and that's why he had to turn around. 
another eye-opening moment for me, you know, I met my Uncle Doyle and learned about that ranching heritage, understood the significance of ranches, understood how they were serving wide-ranging wildlife like black bears. And then I saw the science of the Florida Ecological Greenways Network. And this is a study that came out in 2006. Florida only had 16 million people then. They were projecting what it's going to look like to accommodate a doubling of population by the year 2060. If you look at the red on the map, that represents Florida's development footprint in the year 2016. The green represents Florida's 10 million acres of public conservation lands. Watch what happens if we were to continue on the current trend of sprawling development. By the year 2060, if we continue developing as we have been, the green spaces get surrounded by red and by development. The Everglades, our 4 million acres of public land at the southern tip of the Florida, gets cut off from the rest of the state and country and becomes an island on itself. Places like Ocala National Forest, the Green Swamp, also gets surrounded. This is not a good situation for people or wildlife or water, but thankfully it doesn't have to be that way. Scientists have been talking for decades about a connected network of conservation areas. This is a map from 1994 from Reed Noss at the University of Central Florida. His predecessors at the University of Florida and other partners have been talking, even folks at the Nature Conservancy have been talking about this vision. But it hadn't been integrated into the public thinking, into the political planning processes. So that's where my energy came in. And in 2010, inspired by the ranch and the black bear and by the science, I proposed the Florida Wildlife Corridor Project. I said, let's name it something that makes sense that people can understand and be inspired to help protect. To do that, we did a series of expeditions. I was joined up by the bear biologist I met, Joe Guthrie, and a fellow conservationist, Mallory Likes Demet, then at the Nature Conservancy. And we paddled and walked a thousand miles for 100 days through Florida from the Everglades to Georgia on that solid red line. And we did it again in 2015 on the dotted red line from the Everglades headwaters near Orlando, around the Gulf Coast to Alabama. And what these expeditions did was prove that we still have a connected green space that uh, an eager human or a bear or panther could still travel through the state of Florida. We helped put the concept on the map with stakeholders and it was an amazing experience to see the state of Florida from the inside out. Here we are in Everglades National Park, push pulling north. I learned so many things, one of which was how vast is the Everglades on the state of Florida. We paddled and hiked and trekked for 51 days before leaving the Everglades watershed just north and east of Orlando. After those two big expeditions, we'd done a pretty great job of getting the corridor concept on the map with our fellow conservation organizations, with people who already loved things like wildlife corridors, with a lot of the landowners who welcomed us across their properties. But we hadn't yet reached the mainstream public with it. And that's when I started looking at the story of the Florida Panther. I actually got an opportune assignment from National Geographic Travel to go spend one day photographing Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge. And not being a very good businessman, I turned that into a two-month effort to try to get a picture of a panther with a camera trap. And in the blog, I wrote about that assignment. It's called Cooperative Bear, Frustrating Panther. Because that is the extent of the panther photography I got with two months of camera trapping in the Fakahatchee Strand. But this female panther, known by scientists for her crooked tail that probably happened in an injury, basically was daring me to follow her into this world and try to tell her story. And the more I learned about the panther, the more I recognized that the Florida panther was the ultimate emblem of saving a wildlife corridor in Florida. I wrote to the National Geographic Society. I got my third grant from them, this time to start the Path of the Panther Project. And the reason we focused on the Florida panther is because it is the last big cat surviving east of the Mississippi River. There were only 200, there are only 20 in total existence back in the 70s and 80s. They're up to 200 today, but if they're ever going to survive for the long term, they need access to more territory throughout the rest of the Florida Wildlife Corridor. Lots of reasons why they're such a great ambassador. I had no idea how difficult it was going to be. 
This is my base camp I had set up in Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge with a few furry visitors passing by one day when I was away, caught on my camera trap. And so I began trying to get pictures of panthers, but early into the project in November, 2016, my colleagues and heroes at the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission got this granny black and white photograph at Babcock Ranch State Preserve and combined with a track from just one day before, they had the first evidence of a female panther expanding the range of the species out of South Florida for the first time since 1973. So this became a big deal. It became the focus of my storytelling from that point forward. Let's take a second with this map. The green area is the Florida Wildlife Corridor. I'll tell you a bit more about that. The Florida Wildlife Corridor has those 10 million acres of public land, and then it has about 8 million acres of opportunity area. These are lands that are farms and ranches and groves, compatible land uses that can help keep the corridor connected. All that is put together in the dark green of the overall corridor. And you can see in yellow, that is the only breeding territory of Florida panthers east of the Mississippi River. And they have literally stuck in the southern tip of Florida. You can see how the rest of the Florida Wildlife Corridor is basically their lifeline. And the reason I call it a lifeline, in order for the panther to survive and have enough genetic diversity to be viable, there needs to be three or four times as many as there are now. And the only way that's gonna happen is to have access to three or four times as much land. And that's where the Florida Wildlife Corridor comes in. So remember those camera traps I showed you from Gabon. Fast forward 15 years and here I am in my homeland uh, in the Everglades, trying to get pictures of even, even more elusive cat than that leopard I showed using a camera trap. I'll show you a short video and then talk more about that technique. An animal like the Florida Panther is not gonna walk three feet from my camera lens no matter how long I wait there. By setting a camera trap, placing my infrared beam at the right place, putting my strobe lights in the trees, and kitting a camera in a waterproof box that can endure the elements, I can help the panther take its own picture. So that video shares the idea, but it's ridiculously unfair because it compresses like two years of work into 30 seconds. It makes this kind of thing look easy. But in truth, it's the hardest thing I've ever attempted professionally in my career. Um, the first two years of the project were producing images that looked more like this. Panthers are super elusive. They have a home range of 200 square miles. That's four times the size of Miami or twice the size of Orlando for a single panther. They're mainly nocturnal. Um, where we were setting camera traps, we'd see a panther come by maybe once a month in a, in a good area and only every other month facing the camera. So you can see um, the panthers continued to frustrate me, um, but the bears themselves were not always necessarily cooperative. I started putting cameras aiming at my cameras to see what was going on and why they weren't working sometimes when I would come back a month later to change the batteries. <laughs> this is funny looking now as a young black bear is flossing its teeth with my ethernet cable that's connected to my flashes. But I was pretty traumatized by what happened because that trail that you're seeing is underwater eight to nine months a year. I only have a three month window each year to try to get a picture of a panther in that primordial swamp. And that bear came and wrecked my camera the day after I changed the battery 29 days before and I lost maybe my chance for the next year. But finally, a couple years into the project, things started to click. And this was an amazing moment. Um, this was actually the days leading up to Hurricane Irma in 2017. Irma destroyed this camera. It drowned the camera system. We weren't allowed in there for two months or after the storm had hit. We had to chainsaw our way back. The camera was bobbing beneath the surface of the water, flooded out, but buried be beneath thousands of false triggers on that memory card. We had this photo of a panther flying through the swamp, 
rainwater bouncing off the surface and just capturing the beauty and the majesty and the perseverance of this animal and really gave me a, a boost of hope that the pictures were there and we could keep going. So we started to get pictures like this, pictures the world has never seen of a Florida panther surviving in its never Everglades home. I went to great lengths to show panthers living in these swamp environments, not because this is ideal panther habitat, but the panther's ability to survive in places like this is a large part of the reason they still exist at all, because we wiped them out of existence everywhere we wanted to be, but these swamps were so remote and inhospitable, they avoided conflict with people and survived long enough to, be, to benefit from the conservation ethic and the Endangered Species Act from the 1970s. I also use camera traps to try to illustrate other important points. Here, you have a panther traversing from a cattle ranch onto Audubon's Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary. And the point of this picture is not to show division, but to show that all the adjacent properties are working together as one habitat from the perspective of a wide ranging animal. Audubon's Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary is 20 square miles in size. It's pretty big, but it's only one tenth of the size a male panther needs for its territory. So the only way you're gonna save panthers is to save the wildlife corridor and all these connected habitats as a collective whole. Another point we worked to communicate was the importance of wildlife underpasses and road crossings. This is a project supported by the Nature Conservancy and Department of Transportation, looking down at State Road 80 near LaBelle, Florida. There was already a canal coming up to both sides of the road. What they did was put cross fencing to make it where animals couldn't get on the road, funnels them down towards the underpass, and they put ledges on each side so animals can safely go back and forth. Here's a picture of another underpass down on Interstate 75 between Naples and Fort Lauderdale. There are 30, there are 30 structures like this along that section of Interstate 75 Alligator Alley, and virtually no bears or panthers or large animals are killed by cars or cars cause wrecks with humans because of the cross fencing and the underpasses. The key ingredient for why that is successful is there's public land on both sides of the road, permanently protected, that allows you to come in and make crossings under the road. This picture took five years of trying in that same spot to get a panther coming through, which happened every couple of months at the moment a car was traversing above on the highway. How many of the tens of thousands of motorists going all along these roads know that we have this amazing, resilient animal that could be walking beneath them at any moment. Here's another shot from that same place. It's the most technically challenging picture I've ever attempted. There are 14 camera flashes connected by 300 meters of ethernet cable, three radio channels um, to try to get a picture showing a panther coming through this place. The point is not showing that camera trap photography is hard, but to show that wildlife underpasses work. And it's important that they work because roadkill is the leading cause of death documented for the Florida panther. There are nearly 30 killed every single year on the highways. And one of the best ways to avoid this kind of conflict is to protect more of the wildlife corridor and reduce the tension between conservation and development everywhere else in the state. Give you a little insight of where that panther was killed. This is a this is a decade or so ago, and this is now. You can see the way the sprawl has just squeezed these little tendons of green to smaller and smaller pieces, makes it harder and harder for wildlife to endure. But thankfully, we can get ahead of the development and try to prevent this problem in other places. This picture is from. January of 2018, this is the most significant picture of my career because the female panther in the front is the same from that black and white photo that I showed you earlier. This is the first female panther to swim across the Caloosahatchee River to set up new territory in the Northern Everglades in my lifetime. And she's being trailed by two Florida panther kittens. So, a huge moment of hope. The head of the Panther program at the US Fish and Wildlife Service, when he saw a picture of her said, I've been dreaming about her for 18 years. 
So we have this amazing moment where Panthers are starting to reclaim their homeland elsewhere in the state of Florida, and we have a chance to decide what to do about it. But literally the same year that this Panther was coming north of the Everglades in Babcock Ranch, a new set of toll roads was proposed for that exact same area. The MCORS toll roads, they would have funneled development and new highways straight into the last wildest places in Florida. And this was a huge motivation for me that storytelling to the public is great, but we need to have a political solution or the Florida Wildlife Corridor does not stand a chance. So we worked with the National Geographic Society. We developed an impact communications campaign and we started telling the story of the Florida Panther in a form to present to our state lawmakers in Tallahassee. In April of 2021, we worked with conservation partners and my team at Wild Path and the Path of the Panther Project helped write the Florida Wildlife Corridor Act. This is a piece of legislation that defined that geography. There was already known in the science, but defined it as a conservation priority for the state of Florida, as a now or never moment. If we do not identify and protect this corridor, we are going to lose it to projects like that toll road and the unintended consequences of development. My first feature story in National Geographic Magazine titled About the Path of the Panther Story was published that same year. And we presented copies of the magazine to every lawmaker in Tallahassee. And we screened copies of a film called Saving the Florida Wildlife Corridor. And the response was incredible. It was amazing to see the way the story of the Panther and the story of the Wildlife Corridor could unite people and bring them together and galvanize interest in saving the Florida Wildlife Corridor. I'm happy to report today, if you haven't already followed this, that in 2021, there was unanimous bipartisan support for the Florida Wildlife Corridor Act and the movement we were growing, the political movement we were growing, then inspired $400 million of investment in land protection, conservation easements, and acquisition in the corridor in that year. And if we, if we total up the funding that's been inspired by the Florida Wildlife Corridor Project and the Path of the Panther Project, since 2021, there, there will, if, if the budget this year gets signed as is, there will be $2 billion of new funding appropriated for land acquisition and conservation easements. I'm sharing a picture of one of my Florida heroes, Carrie Lightsey, who's a rancher in the Northern Everglades. Um, coming back to that female panther who swam the Caloosahatchee River, I said, Carrie, what does it mean to have panthers coming back into the Northern Everglades where you have your family's cattle ranches? And I'll never forget what he said. I was out in the swamp servicing a camera trap on speakerphone, his voice, deep Southern voice reverberating through the cypress. He said to me, Carlton, the Panther is going to have to help us save Florida. And then he went on to say, it's, it, it's going to help people understand why we need to save these vast connected spaces. So standing here today, speaking to you with the Path of the Panther book and film and stories behind us, and this story really starting to take hold with the leaders and communities of Florida, I have renewed hope that the story of our state animal rising up out of South Florida swamps can continue to inspire this public movement to save the Florida Wildlife Corridor and show what's possible for balancing conservation of ecology and economies together. And that's exactly what's needed, not just here, but throughout the country and not just for Panthers, but for ourselves. This is a copy of the new book, Path of the Panther. I'm humbled to have Carl Heisen writing a forward and so many of my heroes from the Florida conservation community featured within it. And I'm thankful to you and to Climate First Bank for giving a platform for this story. I ask that you all please engage with this, engage with me, watch the film, check out the book, show this Florida to everybody you know, and show the hope of what we can do together when we focus on land and focus on solutions. Um, and I really appreciate looking forward to talking more with Ken now and taking some questions. Carlton, thank you. That was absolutely awesome. And I learned more stuff. Um, I had a couple of questions. One of them was the, I did the introduction and um, 
noted that you're an eighth generation Floridian. I'm a third generation and my wife's the fourth generation. My kids are fifth generation. Um, but I got to thinking about that. And that's a long time ago. And so I Googled how long's a generation and it's 25 years. So you guys go way back, like 200 years in the, in the state of Florida. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your family heritage? And I, I mean, there's been amazing stories like your great great granddad and your uncle and such but is there anything else you'd like to embellish on that well it's um you know and i think that generation times were sometimes shorter back then but um and i think my eight generations and seven may have come at the same time um and so it might be seven who were actually born here i'm not sure but it they were here they were here in the 1840s. They, there was a registered cattle brand in Hillsborough County by 1850. They homesteaded in Wachula in 1858. Um, and so they were here and it was it was a interesting and complicated time in Florida. Um, you know, Florida's original indigenous population, the Calusa, Tamuqua, those groups were wiped out by the Spanish and by disease. Um, and so the Seminole and Miccosukee Indians, the current natives who have had connections to Florida forever and are part of the native people of this continent, they didn't actually come into Florida until the 1700s um, and, and associated with Spanish missions and, and such. And, um, and there's this you know, in, just interesting frontier time in Florida. But um, I'm thankful for the heritage just because it's kept me connected to a part of our state that fewer and few po people know about. And it's given me my purpose to help change that, to help show this other side of Florida. Yeah, it's 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 pretty amazing. And that kind of leads into the, <clears throat> the Florida Wildlife Corridor. I don't really think there's probably anybody on the planet that could have pulled that off but you. And it's the whole combination of the history, the um, the the unique ability to storytell um through words and and pictures and 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 all of your background um but it just seems like how on earth did you pull that off in a state like florida you know and then um, my follow-on question to that would be how do we as florida citizens make sure it gets continued because there's always the fear the legislature will undo something or do a back door or something well the um there's not a silver bullet to how we've had the success we've had so far other than i believe that like i believe in the power of collaborative place-based storytelling um and certainly my my heritage and my connections to a lot of the working lands and ranching community helped people opened doors to me and participated in a story where um they might have been reticent to work with a someone from the Sierra Club, but it, it's truly about listening and elevating the voices of the people on the land themselves. We made another film called Saving the Florida Wildlife Corridor, and it's told through the farmers, ranchers, oyster and clam farmers, um, fly fishing guides, people who are on the front lines of conservation. They're not your usual Sierra Club person, but they are living guardians of these places and and elevating their voices because you know i'm a visitor compared to them who you generational fishing guide you know generational mikasuki airboat captain these are these are the voices and so it's about co collecting and lifting the voices of the place and it resonates across party lines across geography um i think showing the story and the hope is important we are going to lose parts of the corridor we are losing parts of the corridor we can still save the function of the florida wildlife corridor by empowering the people who want to be part of the solution not every rancher wants to save their land some are going to develop the ones that do we need to support the policies that give them a chance to keep farming and ranching because that's not just good for Panthers, that's good for economy, that's good for water. And so it's been about listening, it's been about doing things that are collaborative, 
And I do think that National Geographic is a superpower that helps um, because very rarely in the world do you find a media brand that is universally trusted across the political spectrum. And, and that, that was um, something I'm very proud of to be able to represent and, and we'll keep using going forward. Right now, you know, the Florida Wildlife Corridor has become a movement and the lawmakers speak of it as the iconic Florida Wildlife Corridor. Senate President Kat, Pat, Kathleen Pasadomo talks about it as our central park and the way that we balance and improve the value of our built environments is by protecting the associated big green core. Um, but we absolutely cannot rest on our laurels. We have to keep telling this story, keep growing the movement, keep inspiring the next generation of leaders, keep inspiring the next generation of youth to um, participate in solving this problem of balance for the future of Florida. Well, I think maybe you, you hit on a key element there and that's the youth part. And that's one thing that's just troubled me for a long, long time is I, I just, I, I dread the day that hopefully never happens when one of my grandkids says, grandpa, what was your generation thinking? You know, and, and what am I going to tell them? Um, and I'm you're gonna, just, you're, you're going to tell them you got the carbon out of the atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell them we saved the biodiversity crisis or health. No, no, I, sorry, I cut you off, but I, to, I totally get your question. And um, that's why I'm so excited about this phase of the work. The, the, I, I run an organization called Wild Path, and our mission is to use storytelling and campaigns to inspire land protection. It's, it's what we did with the Path of the Panther Project. It's what we continue to do with the Florida Wildlife Corridor. Check it out at wildpath.com. One of the things we do is tell the story of progress and hope. Just Tuesday on the 23rd, the governor and cabinet approved 40,000 acres of land for protection in the Florida Wildlife Corridor, 13 properties across the state. Every cabinet meeting, six times a year, new properties are being considered. I have myself and a team of photographers we send out with the state agencies to get those pictures so that we can keep growing the energy and support across social media, across earned media. Um, but so I'm thankful to have tools like that, but I'm really excited about what we have the opportunity with, with the Path of the Panther Project, because these sometimes difficult to access concepts like the Florida Wildlife Corridor all exist within the exciting story of our state animal. And we have it in a book and we have it in a film that is age appropriate for definitely all middle schoolers and high schoolers in the state of Florida and younger audiences you know, if I didn't say the word "damn" and there wasn't a dead panther, it'd be rated G. <laughs> but, it, but um, that that's a huge opportunity. I would love everyone's here's participation and ideas about. You know, we're we're raising funds now to try to build the educational programming, working with National Geographic Society, working with Disney, trying to get this story into the hearts and minds of our youth and of our families around the state that we have this really cool thing to be proud of in our state animal, the Florida Panther. And that opens up the conversation about all of these other issues. Awesome. Um, boy, that was, no, you didn't cut me off because that was a perfect, perfect response. Um, we're about to run out of time and go to question and, and the Q&A, but I, I had a couple of thoughts that's more uh, maybe biological than anything else. But when I watched the film, there's the portion in there um, that describes a neurological disorder that some of the kittens have. And um, I, I, when I, when the film ended, I was left with the feeling, well, what happens? What happened to the kittens? Is it curable? Is it something that, you know, that kind of thing? That's, that's my question. I'll try to give a quick answer to that one. Um, the, Neurological disorder, FLM, still persists. It persists in bobcats and panthers, so it's not a genetic mm -hmm. disorder. It's most likely an environmental toxin or a new pathogen that is causing um, neurological problems for mm -hmm. affected animals. Some kittens have been affected and then improved. Other have been euthanized or died from it. Um, FWC, our state wildlife agency, is still investigating this, trying to find the solution. To me, it is a very clear example of why we need to get the panther recovered across the state of Florida and beyond. 
if you have all of your Panthers in known existence in a single patch of land in the Southern tip of Florida, whether it's a disease, whether it's a series of environmental disasters, you're putting the whole species at risk. The best thing we can do for the health and future of the Panther is have it no longer, you know, stop being the South Florida Panther because it's been functionally the South Florida Pan Panther managed on life support in the Everglades to becoming the Florida Panther once again, where it thrives in the pine woods through central Florida and the panhandle and back to the Southeastern United States. And the Florida Wildlife Corridor is that lifeline. And so it just comes back to this idea of rewilding the lands that are still there and doing it for the benefit of wildlife and people. Well, that, that leads me perfectly to my next question. When I was looking at the corridor map and, and looking at even the, the apocalyptic map of 2060 or whatever that the date was, where the entire state is like development except up there in the panhandle, can, can there be a population transferred from South Florida up into the panhandle and then you get the genetic diversity and or bring in some some mountain lions from out west or something is there is that Biologi possible? biologically that would absolutely work you could drop off female panthers from the everglades and ocala national forest and apalachicola national forest in the okefenokee swamp of southern georgia in the appalachians and they would thrive um the question is social carrying capacity you know what is the tolerance of people to coexist with a predator and my hope through the path of the panther story is it'll open up open up the dialogue and open people's minds to the benefits of having a panther back on the landscape you know the northeast is you know the amount of people who are hurt or killed in car crashes with white-tailed deer the amount of problems of tick-borne disease the um the proliferation of hogs and coyotes across the southeastern United States, mm -hmm. panthers will help contribute towards taking care of a lot of those problems. You know, there's always a risk when you have a predatory animal, sure, but it might be that the risk out far outweigh um, the benefits. And so, telling that story, I think in the film Path of the Panther, there's a rancher, Elton Langford. He's a 12th generation Floridian descended from the Spanish um, as a cattle rancher. And he has a very refreshing perspective. He talks about the panther and the rancher both being endangered species. And the panther, because it's going to mobilize people to invest in the solutions for land protection, actually will help save ranching. Voices like that will help take the edge off or increase the willingness to coexist with these animals from the hunting and farming and ranching community throughout America, who are on the front lines of suffering losses of calves and livestock potentially, but also can receive some of the benefits. So that, you know, that's one of my hopes is that that conversation that you just mentioned is not just theoretical, but it becomes a real solution where the, where the panther can repopulate the East and in doing so help be a guardian for the green space that is a climate solution and a biodiversity solution for everybody. Boy, it would. Um, Lauren, do we need to go to Q&A? Is it time? Yeah, I feel like you guys are touching on a lot of the questions though that we're also getting in the chat, but I'm happy to, to you guys can either keep going or I can pull some, some questions from our Q&A. Well, real quick, I just wanted to show the audience. Um, this was the first book of Carlton's that I read, The Florida Cowboys, and it's it's very, very good, and it's, it's very historical uh, about Florida and some of our generations of the path, past, and this is The Path of the Panther, and um, I would like to offer a copy of this to any of the viewers that would like one, just um, email us and we'll we'll get you a copy um but i think maybe we've got a whole bunch of questions we probably ought to open it up to the q and a don't you think Lauren? yeah that'd be good while you're going to q and a i'm going to holding up those two books is interesting to me and thank you for supporting sharing the word through them you know i think the subtitles of my books as i look back are almost more important than the titles to me like the subtitle for that Florida Cowboys book was Keepers of the Last Frontier. And that's still what the Florida Cowboy is in Florida. Um, 
and the subtitle for Path of the Panther is New Hope for Wild Florida. And I think those two themes, you know, the rancher and the panther, if they can get along, are, are both sides of the same solution, which is that green space. Um, so thank you for sparking that thought on me and I'll, I'll stop talking and hope to hear some questions from the audience today. All right. Yeah, let's see how many we can power through in eight minutes. <laughs> um, we have one question that says, Carlton, what are your thoughts about the last green thread efforts in bringing expedition ecotourism as an alternative? I think um, expedition ecotourism is a great thing to do. Um, and I wholly support it. I think partner organizations like the Wildlife Corridor Foundation, the Wildly Nature Conservancy, you know, should should look at this. Um, it's hard. And I'm like, knowing the panther there adds mystique. I've spent years trying to find them and only ever seen two in my own camera in my hands. But there, you know, we need to get people connected to these places, tourism, bike trails, knowing about the Florida National Scenic Trail. I mean, that's a thing that you could incentivize your audiences to do. We have an amazing scenic trail. You don't have to go to the Appalachian Trail. You can go walk the Florida National Scenic Trail through Big Cypress, through Three Lakes Wildlife Management Area, through the Panhandle. Um, you're just awakening our population to the to the adventures and the paddling opportunities and everything that exists. And so much can be done with tourism. And we have 130 million tourists come here every year. If just a small fraction would engage with understanding the nature and being a voice for it, it'll really make a difference. Absolutely. Um, I have to remind people that Florida is more than Disney World all the time um, when they come to visit me in Florida. <laughs> um, so I guess this might maybe even tie into that answer, but another question we have are like, what are your suggestions to get youth more involved in policy making and developing urban corridors? Yeah, I think, um... <laughs> I mean, I'm coming back. To, I want I want youth to see this film, um, and I want them, I want them to see the film in partnership with the local conservation organizations, groups like the Nature Conservancy with the statewide presence. So many groups that can kind of ignite the interest in in this. Um, we need to kind of bring it to the classrooms, and then we need to bring the classrooms into the wild. And they're. Um, great organizations doing field trips to nature centers. You know, I think Palm Beach does a remarkable job getting students out to explore um, Palm Beach County natural lands, but that's a, something that can be repeated and expanded statewide. And it's a, it's a really important thing we look into. Yeah. Um, what about Florida-based businesses? Do you have any suggestions for how they can support the mission of Path of the Panther? Well, I mean, being being transparent, we need financial support. I mean, go to pathofthepanther.com. Um, our our organization, Wild Path, is grant supported. We need everything, all the help we can get to grow a megaphone for this story and to continue to be a catalyst. Um, you know, through the through the storytelling, we we create an, an, a public awareness engine that helps lift and support all of our land trust partners and others, but, but we need help telling this story. Um, I think I've been working for 15 years for this moment to get the wildlife corridor um, into a shape and form that it can be widely shared. And through the path of the Panther, I think we have a tool that can really grow and scale people's connection to the wildlife corridor. Um, so please think about ideas that we can raise the awareness or, or get people involved or support the educational programs together. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like that ties into another question we have on what can specifically in this case, what Lake County conservation groups can do to protect the wildlife corridor. So it sounds like all of those really tie in, but do you have any other thoughts there? Did you say Lake County? Yeah, I think it's a matter of, um, looking at maps and understanding where your properties intersect with the wildlife corridor. And I'll make a point that the Florida Wildlife Corridor is the trunk of the tree with the biggest branches, but all the branches and all the leaves matter. And so just because a conservation property in your county and your backyard might not be within the quote Florida Wildlife Corridor, 
connecting and protecting that landscape is still important. But by we we had to put a name on it in order to give it a space in in the public mind and the public conversation. And we don't want that name to be overly simplifying. And another thing is, you know, the wildlife corridor and the panther hook people in. If we were to name this prop properly, this is the Florida wildlife, climate, agricultural, resilience, water supply, clean air, vitality corridor. You know, it's like all these things. Yeah, but in 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 a, I, I sometimes I think it's important to drill into those subpoints. This is about this is about balance for people and balance and supply for our urban cores and thriving economy just as much as it is about the future of the Panther. All right, since you only have three minutes, I'm gonna to try to attempt to combine a few of these questions into maybe one question. Um, Cause there's a lot of people asking like, um, like, you know, what's the status of those toll roads or, you know, what are other, and like, how are, you know, is, is there anything under threat with the wildlife corridor at the moment or, you know, all these different questions. So I guess maybe to try to sum all that up, you know, are there current threats to the wildlife quarter? Or um, I know we also had someone um, talk about the Florida right to clean water amendment that they're pushing through. So I guess if you have any just thoughts on like current, um, you know, current status of projects or bills or just the state yeah. of Florida in general at this time. Great question. Yes, there there are always threats and, and new threats will emerge. Um, a lot of these threats are unintended consequences of economic plans that don't perceive the other side or, or the cost associated with with the program. The toll roads have been a major catalyst in my thinking. The, there's a road called the Heartland Parkway in 2006 that drove me to start the Florida Wildlife Corridor Project because there was an article by Cynthia Barnett in Florida Trend about the Heartland Parkway, a similar proposed toll road from Orlando to Naples. There were five different types of corridors mentioned in the article. Transportation, economic development, multimodal transportation, hurricane evacuation, maybe even some kind of communications broadband corridor, no mention of wildlife corridors. So it's just a wake up call that the most fundamental type of infrastructure had remained absent from the conversation. Um, I'm happy to report that in 2019, when the MCORS toll roads were being considered, at least the Florida Wildlife Corridor was in the conversation and now it exists in legislation and because of the florida wildlife corridor act because of the bringing together of these different parties you know, the department of transportation has a florida wildlife corridor layer and they're planning tools and they're looking at it and it's we need to be planning our built infrastructure and our natural infrastructure together because they 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 have to be planned for to coexist um but there are plenty of threats i think one of the biggest challenges of our time is counties making land use decisions individually without consideration of coordination with adjacent counties. Um, so we need some sort of functional statewide plan. Um, getting that in a regulatory way is, is difficult and maybe not even the best solution, but incentive for land conservation like the Florida Wildlife Corridor that goes across county boundaries is a way. And so we need just conservation to be part of the planning, part of the conversation. Um, and you know, please um, go to pathofthepanther.com. We have a take action tab. We have a place we can sign a pledge. Um, if you stay connected with us, when the next opportunity or the next threat comes up, we can help share how you can engage with your voice. Like on the positive side, there is a national wildlife refuge conservation boundary being considered for Southwest Florida and much of the Everglades there's gonna be chances to add public comment on that and to chime in in your support. It'll give more federal investment to support our state efforts. So stay tuned on that topic. As the next legislative session rolls around, we'll be able to share ways you can support proactive conservation for the corridor or things that need to be we need to be wary of that could create more challenges. Um, so super happy people are being engaged with this and looking forward to telling this story together for years to come. Awesome. Hey, um, hey um, Lauren, what what email address should we have people write to for a book? Because I saw that in the chat. You, you read my mind. So um, if you're interested in receiving a book, you can email marketing at climatefirstbank.com. 
um, and we'll work on getting those sent out for you guys. I know we're over time, but do Ken, Carlton, do you have any last minute thoughts, action items or inspiration to share before we close out today? I, I, I don't, I'm just, I'm just amazed and I'm, I'm really pleased, Carlton, that you joined us. Thank you very, very much. No, thank, thank you all. Um, this, this is a big moment in time. I'm, I'm appreciating the synergy. Um, I'll say it again, you know, go to pathofthepanther.com and, and go watch the film on Disney Plus and Hulu. That'll give you all sorts of ideas. And go to wildpath.com forward slash progress. And that's where we have all the pictures and the maps of the 40,000 acres of land that were just approved this week. And if you all go on your social media, there's a social media toolkit there where you can download pictures and maps. There's an overview of nine of the properties. It can be a single carousel or each of the 13 properties has their own pictures and map and they might be close to your own backyard. But make a social media post, use those pictures, thank the governor and the legislature for the good work they're doing in saving these places because that's the type of momentum we're gonna need to keep it going and keep growing this movement. Awesome. And maybe if you can circulate those links in an email to everybody who is here, that'll make it easy for everyone. Um, I really appreciate it. And I'm uh, headed to the mountains for a film festival where the Path of the Panther is going to show at the Mountain Film Festival in Telluride. So I'm excited about that. And then back to Florida to keep hammering the work for education and outreach in our state. So hopefully your, your flight home will be um, less... Uh, traumatic than the flight out so um, enjoy your seven hour drive <laughs> since your since the second link of your flight was canceled yes we, we will be getting terrestrial but that's okay um all right thank you all um have have a great uh memorial day weekend thank, thank you so you. much for joining us bye everyone bye